Hi, my name is Donna Moles. I'm, I'm honored and privileged to be at Miss Lucille Edwards' house. She has graciously invited us into her lovely home to interview her. Um, she's been in this world for 81 years, and she's going to tell me a little history of her life. Um, Miss Lucille, where was you? Where was you born, and where was your birthplace? First of all, let me thank you for coming. And you're most welcome. Thank you. And now, ask your question. Okay, Ms. Lucille, where were you born and where was your birthplace? I was born in Philadelphia, born at home with a midwife. Okay. What do you think made it possible for you to live for such a long time? Two reasons. One is that God permitted me to live this long. My days were numbered as three score years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be more, so it seems as if I have a little more with 11 years on top of that. And the other is that uh, I live a comparatively sheltered life, not really sheltered, but more or less a person is ne never corrals around. I don't smoke, I don't drink, and I eat most everything. So I live a pretty clean life. Not what you would say clean, but at least not detrimental to my health. I know that you have a lot of memories. Some of them bad, some of them good. Let's talk about the good ones. Tell us about your family ties. Can you tell us anything about your ancestors who have been slaves? Well, as far as your ancestors, let's start with the ancestors. According to what my mother said, uh, her mother was born one day after slavery was abolished. But that's as much as we know about the slavery aspect of it. And uh, as far as bad memories are concerned, I guess most children have bad memories. But all of the good things are that we had a wonderful mother and father. My father was a minister, my mother was a great singer, and we led a very good life. So we were just children that were, my, well, first of all, my father was a man who dearly loved his children. And so, and my mother always insists that we remember that my father was a minister. She always said, do what's right, you know Pop is a preacher. So, what else? Can you tell us about your grandparents, your great grandparents? Well, I I knew my mother's grand, my mother's mother and my and her father. Um, I met them just once or twice when I was around six years old, because they were in Virginia, and uh, they were farmers, and uh, so we only had the occasional vacation there in the summer, and that's as much I knew about them. And Grandma came to Philadelphia when my oldest nephew was born. And that's the last time I saw them. Okay. But they were farming people. Can you tell us about your great, your grandparents? That's the grandparents I'm telling you about. Okay. That's my mother's mother and father. Okay. They were Robert and Julia Gaines. Robert Julia Gaines, mm -hmm. okay. Can you tell us about your children? Well, I have, I'm the mother of six children. I have now living three girls and one boy. Okay. And then one boy, he was in the Navy. He died of an accidental death in the Navy. And the other, my oldest son, Joseph, just passed away in May on his birthday. He died on his, he just went to bed, went to sleep and never woke up. So his wife died 13 years before he did. So he was just alone. And so when they found him dead, they said it was a natural death because he was covered up up to here. Been dead for four days when we found him. It was on a Monday after his birthday. Okay. Can you tell us about your sisters? Um, my sisters, I just have one remaining sister and her birthday was yes, no, day before, no, yesterday, the 8th of October. She's a retired school teacher living in uh, Dover, Delaware and she's married to an Egyptian She's an international trader now since she retired from school teaching. Okay, do you want to tell us about any aunts and uncles? Aunts and uncles. My grandmother had 13 children. And of that group, the last one died in 92 of no in November. So that left none of them, my mother's sisters and brothers, alive. Mm -hmm. you want to tell, can you tell us about your grandchildren? Wow. Uh, let's see how many, I have to count them up, how many did I have? <laughs> oh, I have, oh gosh, five, six. I have a 
about nine grandchildren. I'd have to take a piece of paper and count all it. And about three great-grandchildren and two great-great-grandchildren, which I have never met yet. Did you know anyone of African ancestries who had been enslaved? No, only my great-grandmother, as I told you, because my grandmother was born one day after slavery, so I don't know too much about her. You see, when I came along, if children asked a whole lot of questions about their family, they'd call you frisky. Don't be asked a whole lot of questions. That's what they did. They didn't tell you too much. And of course, I have my reasons of wondering why they did that. But if you look at the color of us, you see different things. Maybe there are some things they just didn't know. Just here recently, I met another family of gangs that were from Georgia. And uh, they look very similar to the gangs here in Pennsylvania. And I have a reason to believe they must be related to us. But here's the thing of it that we can't claim any blood relations. And I'm sure the slave owners must have sold the people out to the different slave owners, you know. So, but all the characteristics are there. So they accepted me, I accepted them, so we're cousins now. Mm -hmm. tell, us, tell us how your black friends and acquaintances have treated you. Nobody treats me anyway unless I let them treat me. So I'm treated wonderful by black and white, with the exception I had a little few few uh, brush-ins with the help that I have come here to take care of my husband. But when they get nasty with me, I know how to get them out of here real fast. I don't mess, nobody messes with this lady. I like myself, I love myself, and I love people. And you will not, no man, black, white, old, young, fat, skinny, looks down on me. You are my equal. If you consider yourself lower than me, I'm just as low as you because in the sight of God, Nobody is perfect. We all are sinners and come short of the glory of God. But I will not allow you to be better than me. I have been told that in the old days, our people in most cases will always have to say hello to another wherever they meet, whether you were friends or strangers. Is that true? That depends on what neighborhood you lived in. Now, there are certain streets when we live in Philadelphia we wouldn't dare walk through because they were called the toughies, and they were the little small streets. And you wouldn't expect nobody to say hello to you there. But in your neighborhood, when you met a neighbor, the men always tipped their hats. And the ladies did speak. But then here lately, today, you don't find that among people unless there's a, there's a key. If you give a slight smile, regardless of what nationality, they will smile and right away they will talk. But we as a people in our race have a tendency to think that somebody's looking down on us because we're black and we shy away from other people. That's why we don't get a friendly attitude. Now, I never, I am a member of a white church. It is now, oh, I would say about 20% colored. But when I first joined, it was all white. I was a second colored member since 1698. I have never known that I was black. They didn't show that to me. I didn't go there with the idea of feeling that I'm black. I went there to join because I like the church. So I've been there for 32 years. I don't even know that I'm black, and they refuse to let you even talk about it. Some of us do not like to talk about the mixing of races that was often forced in the enslaved ancestors. By their owners, for the most part, this is an obvious by hues of colors that make us a race. Most of us are a mixed heritage. However, very little is said about this. Does your family tree tell the story? Well, <clears throat> the family tree tells the story, but a lot of it we can't document. But we only go by what was told to us, and then by pers uh, personal appearances. Now, there are some of us that are black, and some are very fair. So we know that the white man had to be in there. But then on my mother, on my father's side, there's three races represented, white, <coughs> Indian, and black. Uh, that's the Indian from uh, overseas. Okay. It has been seen many times that the effects of race mixing between whites and slaves caused some social problems that, have harmful, that were harmful for, to black families and black societies. The so-called light-skinned person of African and European ancestries received slightly better treatment than those persons who appear to look like Africans. Do you remember any such experience? Um, that's a 
To me, that's a fallacy. I do know for certain that white people prefer black people. They don't like the high, what we call the high yellows. The high yellows consider themselves better than us. These are the ones they call house niggers, you know. You understand how that, that, that was. You see, when a slave master, from what I was told, goes down into the compound and mix with the women, those children look better in the house than those woolly head ones, you know. So they were the house niggers. But I do know this one thing. White people working for the few short times I worked in public, white folks prefer you being real what you are. The light ones they don't care too much for. That I know. I don't know how someone else will find it, but that's the way I found it. During one period of time, preferred housing was restricted to whites only. People of color were usually restricted to buying homes that were no longer considered appropriate for whites and segregated from whites. People describe the homes in which you, which you have lived and their locations. What was the home? Was that home new that you lived in? Well, now, I, I think this is what they call redlining. Uh, they do that now more than they did in those years. Uh, much of the uh, housing had to do with, uh, I would say, church life. If you belong to a Catholic church, most Catholics live in a certain section and there was a mixture of races. Now, I lived in, when we were born, we were living in an all-white German and Irish neighborhood. And my father was about, it was about three colored families in the whole block. And I remember, just offhand, I heard my father, you know, at night, I didn't sleep very much. And my father would come home and I would hear him talking to my mother. And he said to her, you know, Joe, I was talking to Mr. Baumgartner, and he said, say, Reverend, the damn niggers are moving in here. Why don't you move out? We're moving out. They didn't consider us as black, see? But that's the way they felt, see? And we certainly were. You could tell we were colored. But this is, we were living there because my father was able to buy the house. And the people who didn't have the money lived in the smaller streets where they rented. Now, today, it is such a thing. There are certain sections they don't want blacks in. That's for sure. When I first moved up here in 1967, it was all white with the exception of about four colored families. And that when they began to move out, the poor white people who stayed in, they were the ones we had problems with. And finally they left. I lived in between a Jewish rabbi on this side and a upstate Dutch on the other side. Excellent people. So, but, uh, but more or less, it's the way we, Home training, I think, today is what causes us not to be able, this is one of the reasons, I wouldn't say the main reason, but we can't live wherever we, wherever we want to. We don't correct our children, we don't have a decent type of home life for our children. Our children are out of control, all over the place, so this is it. But if you have the money, it is a law, you can live anywhere. But if you come in with a bunch of unruly black children, that's enough to scare any white folks. Were the streets paid? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. After all, this is a city, you know. The only one street I knew that wasn't paved, that's 46th Street between Haverford Avenue and Market Street, where the uh, Pennsylvania Middle Institution was, just on the soft shoulders were dirt. And, that's, and the walkway was dirt, and that's what we used to call walking across the dusties. That was all part of the hospital. Thing. But that was the only street that wasn't paved. Did you, um, did you have sidewalks? Of course. Were you near? car, brick, red brick sidewalks. Red brick, not concrete like you have now. Were your neighbors friendly? Extra friendly. Could you trust, trust your neighbors? Nobody locked the doors at night. You in the bed, the last person who came in locked the door because no one had keys in the house then, except the father and mother. So. That's the reason why nobody locked the doors. If the older brother and sister was late coming in, they could get in that way, which you couldn't do today. You can't even do it in the daytime. Would your neighbors help during emergencies or other adversities? Oh, sure. That's how I learned to take care of sick people. Whenever my mother would say, Sister so and so or Mrs. so and so is sick, I ran to go there and see what I could see and what I could do. And I got started at five years old visiting sick people. Does your home have running water? Sure. 
inside toilets? We had what you call a water closet in the back shed, right off in the kitchen, and a toilet that when you get up over the seat went up and it flushed. It was like a big ball on the back. And you sit down on it, and of course when it when you got up the seat went up and then it flushed. Then a little later on we had toilets put upstairs in the bathroom, the kind that you pull the chain. Mm -hmm. The heating? Oh yes, cold heat. Electricity? Electricity and gas. We had gas burners on in every room and near the door with a little wick on it, lampshade. Sewer lines? Mm -hmm. Sewer lines? Of course, in the city. Cesspools? That would be in the suburban, not in the city. Because we did live for a short time in Delaware County, and they did have a cesspool, and it didn't run over. It was something they put in to keep it from running over, and every, about like once or twice a year, maybe once every two or three years, they would come and clean it up. Excuse me. Septic tank? Mm -hmm. Radio? Oh, yeah, we had a radio. I remember we had a Philco Super Heterodyne number seven. Casino. <laughs> Old TV. radio. TV? There were no TVs then. TVs didn't come in, into our homes until 19, uh, 19, let's see, in my home, like 32, 33. Anybody had a TV, everybody in town went to their house to see what the TV was like. Okay, My father had the first gas refrigerator, which nobody would breathe, believe that gas would freeze. It was called Electrolux. People would come in to see it. It did actually freeze. The gas company put that out. Mm -hmm. What do you think about uh, VCRs? That's just here. Lately, I don't have one. I don't want one. I can get enough junk on the ordinary television without getting junk on that. Air conditioning is my television. It's right over top of the little lamp in the kitchen. Uh, we, we don't have air conditioning, we have fans. There's a little lamp on the counter. Did anyone ever fall through the outside toilets? Not in my house, but I've known a case where it did happen. You wouldn't want to hear that, would you? <laughs> you can talk. This lady weighed about Oh, about 500 pounds, and behind the house I had a row of outhouses, Johnny houses they call them. And when she uh, went out, I heard the sirens going. This is in Delaware County, and the sirens went off. I thought it was a fire, and when I went to look, and we ran up the street and we saw the fireman standing with his hand inside of the uh, Johnny house door, and we looked. She was standing down into them up this big, up this high, and so what happened? When the fires you got there, they got her out of there, and of course they hosed her down. It was the hottest day in in uh, August. So after they got her out, we were walking up toward the railroad station. Me and another lady were saying it's a shame about her. I'm not calling her name. And somebody came in between us, a man. He parted us too, and he says, "Listen, sweetheart, let me tell you, I'm gonna give you a piece of advice. From now on, all you big women stick to buckets." Some people have said that the outside toilets were often turned over on mischief night as a Halloween prank. Is that so? Never heard of it. It might have been in, not in our neighborhood. How did they keep the toilets from over flooding? They dug them, dug them deep enough. Then they put lime in it too, you know, that sort of eat it up. Do you like Philadelphia as a place to live? Love it. Have you ever need any service from the city? I have. Were these service satisfactory? 90%, I'll say. What is the political situation? Well, I don't know how to answer that. I really don't know. That's one of the things that's the furthest from my mind. That I think I'll skip. Okay. Are the neighborhoods organized? Yeah, this one, we do have a, a block committee that cleans up. Mm -hmm. Do they seem to care about people of color? They're all black here, so uh, it's pretty, I would say it's pretty normal. How were the senior citizens treated? Now, I don't know. There are not that many senior citizens in this block. They're mostly younger people. I would say are under 60, so I wouldn't know. 
as I understand it, most senior citizens that's treated the worst is treated worse by their own families, you know. Because I'm listening to stories that the nurses' aides who come here they tell me about the people they have to visit and how they families, you know, I think it's more or less a thing of money, this business of Social Security. They can keep them there, they can get the Social Security. You hear some horrifying tales, really. What was the highest level of formal education that you received? Kindergarten. No. <laughs> First year high. Did you attend kindergarten? Oh, yes. Where did you attend kindergarten? Martha Washington uh, School, public school. Was it integrated? Not at that time. The only thing, only integration there was the teachers and the principal. And what kind of school buildings did you study? What'd you say? And what kind of school buildings did you study? School buildings? Building, yeah, there was Martha Washington. Um, I, if you mean, if I understand what you mean, what type of a school building it was? Yes. Well, it was a typical old school, the stone with the wooden floors and wooden steps, everything creaking, and it was quite nice. Of course, that's all we knew at that time. So uh, I even remember my kindergarten teacher's name, Miss Henderson, and the principal named Mr. McCracken. I know they must have been dead years and years and years. And after that came Marie S. Chase, and she was the first black principal. After that, it was a turnover of all colored teachers. What type of textbook did you have, and what was their condition? Textbook? Yes. You had very good textbooks, and in those days, you could bring them home, <coughs> as long as you bring them back, you know. But I understand today, they don't have enough to bring home. Mm -hmm. What kind of instructional material did the teachers use? Well, one thing they don't have today, they had penmanship. We were taught to write. I can prove it. If I would give you a pen, take this pen and hold it. R uh, show me how you would write. What do you want to write my name? Yeah, see that? You see that? Now you see how your finger is? We weren't taught to write like it's like it's, we were taught to, this is the, this is the method. You had, you, we had exercise with the finger, push, pull, push, pull, over, over, and this is the way you held it, like that. You want, you find some people, uh, tellers in the bank holding a pencil like that. Mm -hmm. There was a form that you had to, and that way you wrote. But you, did you see how I held it like this? Yes. Now you see, now you hold it. So hold it like this? That's the way. Okay, and write like And that. that's the reason why people my age write better than the younger people today. Okay. Okay. Did you have a cafeteria? No, we had a lunch room, old dingy lunch room that they served. Uh, 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 agate cup of vegetable soup and a couple of crackers and a graham cracker. That's what we had in the basement. We had a cook there, a great big old cook with flat feet. You made that soup, and soup has never been as good since then. But the best soup in the world. What kind of toilet facilities did your school have? They had uh, just toilets that didn't have no backs on them, just seats and that's all. What kind of heating did the building have? Heated by coal. What kind of recreation did you have? Well, in, out in the yard we did exercises and we had to do the exercises before the class started in the morning. We had to stand up in the, in the aisles in between the seats and do this and all that. <laughs> of course, out in the yard we played. Mm -hmm. How hard was the school work? Well, to me, it wasn't hard. I never was in the, I was in the first grade and the second grade, and then I went on to the fourth grade. I never was in the third grade. Did the teachers act like they wanted you to learn? Oh, yes, the teachers, they cared so much about the kids. Occasionally, they would take a couple of kids home on the weekend with them. Yeah. Or they would visit your house. Okay. Did you like the school? Sure, all the kids love the school. You hated to be sick, but you couldn't go to school. What subject did you like? I liked everything. Do you feel that your education helped you in real life? I would say yes, because if I didn't go any further than in school than what I did, it must have been the groundwork on what I know now. 
Are there other early childhood experiences that you want to share? Like what? What would you like to hear? Any childhood education, anything that's what you Well, I don't know. There's been so many things. I don't, I don't think it was any different. Well, I, I'll tell you one thing. Living in a white neighborhood, all of the children would go to the movies on Saturday. And we would go to the William Penn Theater, which was on Lancaster Avenue and Fairmont Avenue. And uh, this was a very large theater. And when we would go in with all the white kids, me and my sister were only two colored ones. We'd get in there, we'd pay our fare, and we'd start in, the man said, uh-uh, go upstairs. We'd have to go up what they call a peanut gallery. So all of the white kids would go right up there with us. They would not sit downstairs. And I wondered why. They always used to carry a bag of peanuts, throw it down on the people's head. That's why they call it the peanut gallery. And they went up there with us. They wouldn't sit downstairs. They had a vaudeville first and a comic, and then what they call a Path A News, and then they would have the movie. Then Mae Desmond was there, and she had have her, her act on the stage. And we come home. This was on Saturdays. Where did you attend elementary school? Martha Washington. Was it integrated? I told you no. That was a grade school. And then we went to Salzburg at junior mm -hmm. high. Okay. Did you have any black teachers? Well, in, in Martha Washington, mm -hmm. all black. In Salzburg, there was a mixture. Okay. Did you have any white teachers? Sure, I said mixture. <laughs> and what kind of school building did you study? Well, in uh, Salzburg was a new building comparatively to what the others were. I think that was built around somewhere around 1923, 24. Mm -hmm. In that mm -hmm. because it used to be an open lot. It's next to it, across from the Mill Creek Playground. And that was a lot where they had a holy and sanctified church on it. And they built the school there on that lot there, 48th and Fairmont Avenue, 47. Where did you attend junior high school? That's it. Did you have any black, any black teachers? Same thing. But one or two, but they're all white, mostly. What kind of instructional materials did the teachers use? Very good, because when we had, when we took French, we had a French teacher. And of course, a lot of the courses they don't even have in school anymore. We did have, in those days, history, English, science. But today, I understand it's called social studies, or something like that. Yeah, yeah we had math teacher. Okay. And what kind of school building did you study? That was it. I tell you, that was all brick. Barn brick and concrete. What type of textbook did you have, or what was the condition? Good textbook and good condition, but you had to return back. If you didn't, you wouldn't get promoted. In junior high, did you have a cafeteria? Yes, they had a cafeteria there. Um, you could buy your food there. And what kind of um, what kind of toilet facilities did your school have? Modern for that year. What kind of heating did they have in the building? They also were with coal. What kind of recreation did you have? Well, we had to, in the gym, you know. How hard was the school work? Well, it began to get hard because I began to notice boys around that time. <laughs> in the ninth grade, you begin to see boys and it, things got hard. Did the teachers act like they wanted you to learn? Oh, sure. Did you like school in junior high? Oh, yes. What subject What subject did you like? I like uh, science, French, and uh, history. And where did you attend high school? I didn't. I dropped that. Employment has always been a great area of concerns for most black people. We were always cited as the last of the last to be hired and the first to be fired. All honest work is receptacle. How in 44. But actually the banks went up on that around 27, 28. But in 44 I began to level off because I was then able, my kids were getting a little bigger, I was able to have two jobs in one day. So I could get off to welfare. Mm -hmm. Do you think that things in general are better than they were when you was a child? Well, I would say there's more available to us, but the people don't have the right mindset mindset 
to accept the things as they are. They always want you to give them instead of them working for it. Everybody thinks you owe them something. You take a, I was talking to a woman not so long ago who said, they're going to cut all of us off the welfare. I hope they don't take my baby off. I hope that they keep. I said, that's your baby. And that's your boyfriend and your baby. Your, your problem. Nobody's supposed to feed your child. You got that baby. You feed him. She said, that's right. But I hope they don't cut him off. See, in those days, you didn't get welfare. You got a milk slip. If you got out of shoes, they give you a shoe slip in the pad. A place to go get it. And you've seen 500. Thousand women with the same kind of dress, same print, cut out the same thing to give away dresses too, but not coats. Our people have had the right to vote for a long time. However, it was not always available due to racism. When did you first register to vote? Well, I registered to vote when I was 21. What political party did you register as a member? Well, all the whole family at that time, most all black people were. Republicans. Sure, it's just in late years that they went into the Democrat. Well, why did you join that party? Why did you join? My father was a Republican. My own brothers and sisters and everybody. Did you vote for the straight ticket for the party, for that party? Yeah, you vote for it's the only ticket. Just go around through and shoot it on through. That's it. Were the polls watched by both parties? Sure. Did politicians offer bribes for the form of money? Excuse me, in the form of money or drinks for votes to the citizens of any sure. towns that you live in? Certain ones they did. The ward leaders would go around and give them a pint of whiskey to go up there and vote. That's right, that was actually done. Did anyone ever attempt to bribe you for your vote? No, because I don't drink. Do you have faith in the um, political system, politician system of this country? Uh, to an extent, I do, because we, we, the people, elect them, and I think you should be given a chance. There's always there parties that are anti this or anti that, that try to make you think they're not good. So I mean, one is no better than the other, and none's no, one's no worse than the other. They're all the same. It really should be one party. According to some people, in the old days it was often said in the black community that the only free people in the United States was a white man and a black woman. Why was that so? I never heard that. Depends on what circles you go into to hear that. Some of those types of things I'm hearing now today that I didn't hear before. Your birthplace indicates that you were born in 1913. Mm -hmm. Was the president of the United States who was the first president that you can remember? Yes. What is your opinion of him? Well, I think I'm a little child. That's around in 18 when the First World War. I wouldn't know too much about it. Just reading the paper and seeing what's going on. I was just interested enough to read. You know what? President Wilson, that's all. You know anything about that? I knew he got sick and died. What is your opinion of the president's family, huh? Well, they're, as I say, all the same. You, gee, as you, I tell you the truth, black people never talk too much about politics in the home. Only the certain politicians that were in the street who wanted you to vote for them, they had more to say about it. And if you weren't a drinking person, you didn't hang around those folks. I'm more, prim primarily, I was a church person. My family were church people. My family were church people, so our interest was the church, not politics. Okay. What about President Herbert Hoover in 1928? I heard more about him, what they said about him, than, than to actually know. Okay. Franklin D. Roosevelt, Well, he's supposed to have been the savior of all black folks. He's the one who started Social Security and welfare and stuff like that. So naturally, we can get something free. We like that man. Of course, now he's being denigrated since he's dead. Harry S. Truman. And well, they say Truman was all right, too, but I don't really, politics never interested me that much. Okay. The White D. Eisenhower, 1952. Well, I don't know. That, I, I tell you, certain things never interested me, and I never was interested in politics. So none of the presidents, like John F. Kennedy? Well, Kennedy, was really, uh, I'll say they blew his personality up greater than what I think any man should have been. Just like Elvis Presley. They won't even let the man die. So those are just the image that people have of those people. To me, they are just human creatures just like me. Even Lyndon B. Washington Johnson? 
Benny B. Johnson, well, like, oh, I can hear about him running down the road fast, real, driving fast with a can of beer in his head. Mm -hmm. That's all I can remember about him. Of course, he sort of followed what uh, the others had, uh, you know, started before him. Okay, Richard L. Nixon. Well, Millhouse Nixon, well, you know what the story is about him, so we'll leave that go. <laughs> Gerald R. Ford. Ford seemed to be a nice man, but I don't know too much about him. As I say, that in that period, I was beginning to get into religion more, you know, and studying the Bible, so it had very little effect upon me. Okay, Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter, now there, to me, is a man. He's showing what he is today, but they didn't believe that about him before. They say he was the worst president. We couldn't see that, because he was a God-fearing man, and he shows that today. So those type of people get low ratings. But in our estimation, we thought he was a fine man. Okay. Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, a typical movie star. That's about it. George Bush. George Bush, well, eh, nothing, honey. <laughs> I don't have anything to say about him. William Clinton, the president Clinton. of the day? Yes. Well, I said, given a chance, he might show us something, but they. And you know, whenever a man comes in with any kind of idea which is adverse to what they already are espousing, what they do is set up roadblocks against him. He won't be given a chance. Already they're saying he won't be able to run for the next term. So what can you say? This is a system of things. As you know, the military did not integrate until 1950 under the presidency of Harry S. Truman. Therefore, any prior service was in general segregated. Was anyone in your family in the military? Yes, all of them, lots of them. I had two, three sons, and two brothers. One brother, my oldest brother was in the First World War. Of course, you know, they had all black uh, units in that. And then my one son was in the Navy, and he told me that he wasn't particularly interested in being friends with any of the guys on the base, but they had to stick together because they were black. So he was based at uh, Norfolk Airfield. And of course, when he died, it was caused by a white sailor. He ran into the back of his car, knocked it 250 feet, set it up fire, and he was burned on about 80% of his body. He didn't live for six days. So naturally, you know there was a difference in the racial structure there. When were they in the military? My brother, our oldest brother, was uh, in the Army. My son was in the Navy. And my last son that died in May, he was in uh, the National Guard of Pennsylvania. Now, he'd been in there 15 years. He wasn't allowed to make the 16 years, or else he would have got a pension. Uh, General Hershey broke that up. He put in two years with the, uh, the United States Army. But he couldn't get credit for that because they knocked it off. He was in an engineering battalion. And my youngest son, he was in the Army, the Air Force, and the Marines. And he also now works for the Navy. He's in all branches. Did they say if it was segregated or integrated? Well, I tell you, tell you listen, I, 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 maybe I am different than most black people. I never think about being segregated against. Because I don't allow anybody, of course, maybe because I haven't been out in, in the public sector enough to know. But uh, there is differences. I hear my son saying, but I have never found it. See, I haven't been in the, what you call the real workforce. What sort of duty did they serve on the peacetime? I know if they're out there, it's just a reserve, you know. Was anyone in your family in the military during wartime? Sure. My son, uh, the younger son, was in when we had the uh, uh, war in Vietnam. And my brother was in the Saipan expedition. And my oldest brother was in the Second World War. They couldn't want no more war than that. Um, what war did they serve in? As the military segregated and integrated, what tours of duty did they serve during the wartime? Well, my brother was in a Korean war. No, no, the, 
novel was in the Second World War. Was Second World War. Segregated. Yeah, and he, but he, he, one time he told us about he had gotten malaria, and he said when the uh, lieutenant came through and said, spoke to all the guys who had malaria, give this, give him aspirin, no, give him quinine, give him quinine. Say to my brother, give him aspirin. So my brother said he jumped up and grabbed the chair and swung it and hit the lieutenant. He said, you got it, and you're going to give it to me, too. So he was a petty officer, first class, and they broke him down to third class because of it. But there was discrimination as far as medicine was concerned. It seems to be that southern officers were put with northern black men mm -hmm. and vice versa. That way they figured the southern are too hard on black folks, they could keep them in, you know, keep him in hand. But they met a bad one when they met my brother. He let him have it. What was the highest rank achieved? He was petty officer first class. He was a CB in the Navy. And um, um, this Joseph, well, my se uh, older son was a sergeant in the uh, National Guard. And my youngest son, he was sergeant, load master, and all the things in, in in the Marines, the Army, and the Air Force. What did they tell you about the experience with white military personnel during the early stay in the Well, this the last one, he didn't have too much to say about that. Because the white guys are always just pretty much the same. What were the experience with black military personnel during their stay in the military in the United States? Uh, not so much black military, then they, just, he just never... Well, I tell you, he's a very religious person. He don't. He's one that doesn't look for the things like that. So he never looked. He never really tell you the truth. He never told me too much about uh, about the life, and he just he told me about the people in in uh, Vietnam. So he never said too much. He never had anything adverse to say about how he was treated. Not him. What were the experience with white military personnel during their stay in military overseas? This is what I just said. What were the experience with the citizens of the foreign countries during their stay in the military? Well, he said he met some wonderful people that he knew he would never see again. So he said some of the finest. And the one in particular they were he was talking about it were the Montmarts in the northern part of the mountains part of, a, of Vietnam. He said they were someone black like us, you know. Mm -hmm. But he said they were wonderful people. Transportation is obviously very important. Before mass transportation was available, most of society lived at home that was near the workplace. Also, many black people, regardless of the availability of transportation, were also subjected to segregated transportation. Tell us about your experience with personal transportation. Did you ever Use horseback riding for transportation? Horseback? Yes. No, bad, but most of the only horseback I've been, uh, horse transportation is uh, hopping on the back of an ice wagon. But uh, other than that, other than that uh, but I, I remember one time when my second son was born, and that's back in 1938, I went to visit friends up in Belmar, New Jersey, and you had to take the train to go to Asbury Park. And when I went up on a train, all the black folks were put in the car right behind the coal car, you know, with the engine and the coal gondola and the first car and all of that soot used to come in and the white folks in the next car is back. That was the first time I had, outside of going to the movies, you know, first time I knew anything about segregation. Wow. Mm -hmm. Did you ever use a horse, back, a horse and buggy for transportation? No, and that's why I hated my grandfather. We went down to Virginia when I was six years, five years old, six years old. We got ready to go to church. Church was a good distance from the house. And when we got ready to go, my mother and her, her other sister stepped up in this fine buggy and nice horse. I said, wait a minute, Mom, she drove up. You come with Poppy. I waited for Poppy, and my, that's her father. When he did, he loaded up a buckboard full of watermelons. We had to ride on top of watermelons. And to me, in Philadelphia, you had cars. I'm going to ride with watermelon? Terrible. That's the only horse that I've been on. <laughs> then you had to wait till your grandfather stopped and go down in the bushes while you're waiting for him to come up out the bushes and keep going on the journey. 
Did you ever use a boat or a ferry for transportation? Sure, across to Delaware here, going over to Camden, and across uh, Cape May to, to uh, Lewis, Delaware. Did you ever use a bicycle for transportation? Never rode a bicycle. When did you start using an automobile for transportation? When my father bought one. When did you start using a taxi cab for transportation? When I first had my first baby to get to the hospital and nobody was home to take me. When did you start first using a using a bus for transportation? When I went on the first long distance trip. Because then on those days, if you even went to Delaware County, you went, went on a trolley. Trolleys went, which went a long distance. Now where there are buses now, trolleys went. Okay. When did you start using a trolley car for transportation? Hmm. When I was about five years old. Did you ever fly on an airline? Never will, never have. Don't even ask. Communication technology in the last 200 years have advanced very much. We now can talk to people at great distance in a matter of seconds. When did you first see some of this, so, excuse me, when did you first see some send or receive a telegram? Oh boy. In those days, people, and since you call it the oh, good old days, um, how many telegrams you got, you knew somebody had died. Other than that, what would be the point of having a telegram? When did you first see someone make or receive a telephone call? We always had a telephone call in our house. So we, when we were born, the telephone was there. So When did you first see a radio and hear a radio program? The uh, first radio I had, my brother had a crystal set. He used to hang the aerial with a piece of lead on it out the window. Then he had a little crystal with a needle on it. He used to scratch it, scratch it until you, you hear the voice come through. And that was back in 1925. Do you remember any of the programs? No. When did you first see a TV set and experience a television program? Mm, back in, the first time I had a TV was 1944. Do you remember any other programs? Sure, Orphan Annie, A Seal Test Hour. When did you first see an audio tape recorder? Oh, we never had one. Only thing we would remember going to the movies when they first had talking movies, they call it Vitaphone. Yeah, with talking pictures, they call it Vitaphone. Our kids would say, we're going to see the Vitaphone. Before that was silent pictures. And somebody was playing the organ down the front, and the words were written across. None of the kids could read as good as me. I could read. I'd read out loud for the kids, you know. <laughs> when did you first see a video tape recorder? Oh, I see them like in public places or in church when they had one set up. What newspaper have you read during your life? The Philadelphia Inquirer. The Philadelphia Ledger. The Record. The Daily News, the Philadelphia Independent, Philadelphia Tribune, the, um, the Afro-American newspaper, the Christian Review, which was a church one, and the Chicago Defender. They were all the newspapers that you had when I was growing up. Do you remember any important stories? No, all you do is look at the people's picture that you see and see if you knew them, and that's all what care, who cared about the story, you know? Unless there's something happening in church you want to know, you know, those days you had a lot of plays and concerts and things and contests in church and you want to know whether you were, you know, in it. Do you read newspapers that are for people of color? I read anything I can get my hands on. From philosophy down to trash. Do you remember any important stories? Well, I would say the uh, one important story I would speak about this the woman who wouldn't ride in the back of the bus. That's enough right there. That started the wheels going. What books have you read? Everything you can think of. What books have you read that were written by people of color? One, uh, I forget his name right off his head. The one that impressed me so much is the one that uh, 
from uh, in the Torah, up from slavery. Booker T. Washington. That was Booker T. Washington. Mm -hmm. What magazines have you read? Mm -hmm. uh, you mean now? Yes, now, then. Life, Ebony. Uh, 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 Saturday Evening Post. Yes, there was a Saturday Evening Post, and there also was a. Uh, uh, I'll tell you in a minute. Better Homes and Garden, Good Housekeeping, and National Ge Geographic. I love that. Mm -hmm. Outdoor Magazine. What magazine have you read that are published by people of color? Uh, Ebony, and also the uh, Jet. What do you think about the movies produced in the past? Better than they are today. What movies have you seen that were produced in the past by people of color? Uh, what was his name? I, I was thinking of him the other day. He had a gray mustache. He was a... Um, Director of the movie. Will you help me? Um, uh, he was Gordon Parks. Gordon Parks. Mm -hmm. I was very much impressed with his type of movies. Yeah. What do you think about the movies produced today? Trash, junk, everybody jumping in and out of bed, squirming and squeezing, and drinking, and shooting. They're not movies, it's just violence. What movies have you seen recently that are produced by people of color? To tell you the truth anymore, I mostly listen to music. And if any comes up that's by color, I don't know it until maybe somebody tells me later on. Because I don't even look to see the commercial part when it goes through with the names on it. I'm so busy with my husband in the last four years, I don't have time to sit down and get the whole setup book on the, on the movie. During early times and even today, health care has always been a problem with black people. Like transportation, some of us were denied good health care. Then when we did obtain it, it was often provided in a segregated hospital clinic or a doctor's office. Was this true in your case? No, because uh, black folks could get, because in those days we had opportunity to go to the city hospital, was a Philadelphia General, across from the convention center. Of course, you had to walk. You didn't have the car fare, but in those days, the car fare was two tokens for 15 cents. And you could go down and come back for 15 cents. But you find people, there are some people who don't care enough about their health to go. People, and when you went down to Philadelphia General, that was a city hospital, if you were black or white, you were just the same. It didn't make any difference. It was a city hospital. If you had had the necessity to use health care, please tell us what you, what you have experienced. Well, the health care I'm using now is uh, health care uh, and uh, nurses' aides and the nurses. Part of it is from the Philadelphia Visiting Nurse. The other is the, uh, the commission, uh, Philadelphia Commission on Aging. Now, one, uh, the hospital, the union that my husband belongs to, they set up the program. So I get help in the afternoon, which is from the Philadelphia Commission on Aging, and in the morning is from Bayada. Bayada or uh, certified nurses aides and in the afternoon are what you call homemakers. They feed him and dry him. Other than that, that's, it's quite satisfactory. And of course I get the nurses service. Nurse comes Monday, Wednesday, and Friday and maybe uh, now of course since I'm hooked up with the union, local 33, the AFL-CIO, um, where they have a hospital, John F. Kennedy Memorial up in the greater northeast. Well, I can take my husband up there if need be. The doctor doesn't make home visits, but the nurse monitors his uh, vital signs, and she corresponds with the what we call the primary physician. And the primary phys physician prescribes. If anything traumatic comes, we just rush him over. And the ambulance, which doesn't cost me a dime, because Medicare pays part of it, all, all of us. Have you ever been treated by doctors and nurses in your lifetime during the illness or health checkup? Have I what? Have you ever been treated by doctors and nurses in your lifetime during the illness of health checkup? Treated, what do you mean? 
get a treatment or treat it bad. Which one do you mean? Treat it bad? Only once. But as I say, I don't allow anyone to look down on me, so I got her straight right in there. She asked me, who is your doctor? When I went into the emergency, I had stepped on a nail, you know, and, I, and incidentally, I got locked jaw from it. And uh, when I went in, who's your doctor? I said, I told her the doctor's name. Oh, uh, osteopathic doctor, go to your own hospital. Today, that doctor is on the staff in that same hospital. That was a nurse. See, some of them take liberties and say things they, they shouldn't, you know. Like the other existing institution, it is difficult to believe that insurance escaped the effects of racism. In some cases, people of color were able to form their own insurance company. Can you talk about how people of color were able to get insurance? I, I don't know anything about that. I don't know anything. I see. My mother always said we had life insurance for the Metropolitan Life Insurance and a progressive for the sick and accident. And of course, now it's different. We're on Blue Cross and Blue Shield. That's different. That's a setup that everybody is in no discrimination day. Having, having just gotten out of the hospital, I got the same treatment that other people were in there. See, and I'm on Medicare too, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, and Social Security, all everything I am covered with. So I have no problem. The black church has been a powerful institution that has influenced much social change in America. It is very apparent that without the black church, very little change, if any, could have been taking place. Also, the black church has always been a sanctuary from racism. Tell us about your church choir. Church what? Church choirs. Choir? Yes. Why the choir, not the rest of the church? Okay, we're going to get into that. Okay, okay. I sang in a choir from 10 years old up until 1963. I quit. Okay. Tell us about your pastors. Pastors are all right, just like any in anything. Preachers have uh, certain people who uh, butter up to them, as I call them. There's always cliques in churches. But in the church where I am now, there are no cliques. So consequently, some people are dissatisfied because they can't jerk the pastor around. But the ones, it's, it's a known fact, the ones who do the most for in black churches and give the most to the pastor, they're the ones who get the best shape. Tell us about your Sunday school experience. That's how I learned to read. The teachers, those old teachers, were, they took the point of the, of the, of the uh, card and pointed to the word, and she went along like that. And you learned to read in the, in the, in the, in the first, uh, in the kindergarten class. And so it's just one of those things, the Sunday school, that's where you got to learn to read. Tell us about the service that, services that you heard. Well, the services are, black preachers are pretty well noted for being good, good preachers. Some of them white, weren't that intelligent. Uh, I have found out since then because they have misrepresented the actual word, what's there. Because they're getting better. The younger men are better. Tell us about the church picnics and other forms of recreation. That was the greatest thing in the world, to go to a picnic and get lemonade made in a wash tub. Because mm -hmm. they, they, they made them in brand new, uh, brand new uh, galvanized tub. The lemonade has never tasted so good. And uh, they always gave each child a piece of cake and one block of ice cream. You never saw a block of ice cream until you went to picnic. Of course, the stores didn't sell it like that. They sold by the cone, you know. And picnic days were the biggest day in the world. If you, had, you were lucky if you had boys that were old enough to get out to the park to reserve your table at 3 o'clock in the morning before anybody got out there. It was a great day, and all the churches would come into one there at Lemon Hill or Strawberry Mansion in Fairmont Park. They pretty well uh, fixed it so that most churches went the same day. Tell us about the pastor's visitation during your sickness. Well, I tell you, I noticed then as now, black preachers do not visit like they should. They don't have the time. They're off somewhere doing some politics or something like that. But now, I have experience, hand-on experience. Now, the church I used to belong to, when my mother took sick, called the pastor about five different times. He never showed up. When he were taking her out in an ambulance, took her to the hospital, he happened to come up while she's going out the house. When she got in the hospital, he never came. Now, I have belonged to a white church. As I say, predominantly white. As soon as they know I'm sick, when I got in the hospital this last time, 
The nurse turned around, look, I heard her say, it didn't take you long, did it? Here's my pastor right there. And not only, since my husband's in sick, not only do they visit church, they come here periodically to visit me here. Call on the phone, see, do you need anything? Luckily, I don't need anything. They do that not only to me, to all members. I happened to be in the office one time when they called up one of our members who was up in Massachusetts. They called and asked her how she was, said, do you need anything? Do you need any money? But ours don't do that. You're lucky if you get a visit from the pastor. What is your favorite religious passage? What'd you say? What is your favorite religious passage? Passage uh, of the scripture, you mean? Yeah. My father used one, he used to always say, wait, I say, wait on the Lord. And my mother's favorite one was, the Lord will provide for your every need. My favorite one is, as Job says, I know my Redeemer liveth, for he lives in me. And though worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. What is your favorite hymn? Um, this morning I broke down crying because today, as I say, was my mother's birthday. And I could hear her sing a song and it came on the radio this morning. It was, Oh, for the wings of a dove, far away would I fly. And in the wilderness build me a nest and be, and be there at rest. Now my favorite one is, when I survey the wondrous cross on which my Savior died. That's my favorite. Do you want to sing it, Muhammad? Well, well. Then another favorite song of mine is called The Sweet Spirit. I could sing that for you, but I'd have to have an accompaniment. accompaniment. I have it on tape. It's instrumental. Well, anyhow, we'll just well, at the end of the interview, we let you sing the closing. I hope. <laughs> I hope I can sing it. How do you feel about the behavior of the young people today? Well, if I were raising children today, I would be accused of being in child abuse. Because I would bust heads, butts, behinds, anything that would come up in my face. And I tell you, I used to beat mine. And when I got today, I had one to tell me, I remember how you used to beat me. I'm glad you did it because I wouldn't have been a good woman as I am today. I believe in whooping behind, that's right. And you don't talk back to me. That's my grandson, six foot three, tore his head up one day. How do you feel about the behavior of people in general? Absolutely low, trashy people. I don't know where they're getting them from. They must be springing up out of our dung piles or something because they're not people anymore. They all say they don't respect me. I need you should respect me. Who needs to be respected? All honor and glory goes to God. If you respect yourself, you will command respect. You cannot demand it. Is there anything else that you would like to share about the church? Well, I tell you, it has been my life, all of my life, I, the only thing I miss about it now, taking care of my husband, although I do say this much, when I married the man, I said the part of the vows was in sickness and in health, rich or poor, until death do part. That's part of it. And I know now I can't go to church like I used to. So I am resigned to the fact I can't go, but I certainly miss being there. According to the scripture, it says, forsake not the assembling of yourself together or where two or three meet in my name, there I will be. So I would like to be with the people who are worshiping in the presence of God. But since I can't, God understands that this is where I am supposed to be. This is part of my ministry being here, doing for him. He said, at least you do for my little ones, you do for me. That's the little one. Who are the little ones? The little ones are the ones who are incapable of taking care of themselves, or those who are in need, or those who are on their back. So. That's the little one. So if I do it for him, I'm doing it for him. 